Brad Miller was three years old when his life was changed forever because his mom and dad got a divorce. In time, his mom remarried and relocated and didn't take him with her. His family decided it would be best if he and his brother stayed with their dad, Arthur. He said, at that time, I don't think anybody in my family knew how abusive my dad was going to become. He said, I ended up living in fear for most of my childhood. Interestingly, his father didn't drink and, and wasn't involved in substance abuse, but he had a short temper and got used to taking out his frustrations on his son. Millard says if he got embarrassed or cut off in traffic or whatever, he would take a swing at me. I was like his punching bag. Literally, he became extremely physically abusive to him. He said, then a strange thing happened when he was in the ninth grade. His dad was diagnosed with cancer. And it began to add another wrinkle into their world. But in the process, his dad began to be transformed. Brad said, I got a front row seat to see this guy go from being a monster to falling desperately in love with Jesus. By the time he passed away when I was a freshman in college, not only was he my best friend, he was like the godliest man I'd ever known. And it's literally changed the trajectory of my life. It helped him actually discover his own faith. He said, I'd always been into music, but now I'm into ministry because I've never seen a person change like that before, and I've rarely seen it since. I guess I grew up thinking that if the gospel could change that guy, it could change anybody. There was no denying it. During those last years, he really daily took care of his dad's physical needs. They became extremely close. And interestingly, it was his dad's funeral that his grandmother just made an offhand comment to him. She said, I can only imagine what your dad's seeing now. And Millard says, I became obsessed with that phrase. As a 19-year-old, it was easier to think of my dad if I thought of him as being in a better place. You know him if you follow Christian music as the lead singer of Mercy Me. And a song that's become renowned and has literally impacted millions of lives is the song I Can Only Imagine. As a matter of fact, that's how we opened the service for Karen yesterday. And I think of how many families who've gone through loss and that song has been a blessing. It's changed lives. What came out of the ashes of an abusive childhood, a man terminally ill with cancer, God's turned into beauty that has transformed the lives and will continue to transform the lives of many. That's what God does. We've spent 14 weeks, isn't that amazing, talking about the promises of God. And I can tell you this, we could easily do another 14. Because you, you, you can't really do justice to the promises of God in just a few weeks. And yet we've highlighted a lot of different areas of this. And today I, I really want us to look at this subject of God's promise that he will trade beauty for the ashes of our lives. And I don't know who's walked in here today or, or maybe you're joining us online today. And there's a lot of hopelessness that you're feeling. A lot of things haven't turned out the way you thought they were going to. There's stuff right now going on that you go, how can that be happening in my life? And it feels like there's a lot of ashes. I'm here to tell you this isn't what I think. This is what the Word of God says. 
God will take what the enemy has intended to destroy you with. And he will turn it for good. He will take the ashes. And today is a call to rise out of the ashes of whatever has broken in your life. And let it become the beauty of the handiwork of God. I can only imagine what he's going to do for every person who allows him to do that today. Wonderful passage in Psalms 126. To begin reading with verse 4. This is from the Passion Translation. Now Lord, do it again. Restore to us our former glory. May streams of your refreshing flow over us until our dry hearts are drenched again. Those who sow sow their tears as seeds will reap a harvest with joyful shouts of glee. They may weep as they go out carrying their seed to sow, but they will return with joyful laughter and shouting with gladness as they bring back armloads of blessing and a harvest overflowing. I declare that prophetically over the year 2020. This is not a year of defeat. This is not a year that the end has been written to yet. The ashes of 2020 are going to bring forth the beauty of God in the days that are ahead. I want to talk to you about some of the elements of what creates the ashes of a burned out life. The ashes of a burned out nation, a burned out culture, a burned out world. Some pretty common ground. There's areas that become strongholds. And I want to look at two of those today because I think they are essential to an understanding of how do we end up where the great dreams that we've had have been dashed and where things that have been such great hope have become such disappointment. The, the beginnings of those happen frequently as these strongholds get established in our life and in the life of our culture. First of those is a stronghold of transgression, guilt, and shame. Those three together. You know, it's interesting how that when you take a string, it has a little bit of strength, but it it can be broken. But if you take three strands and wind them together into a cord, it's much harder to break it when it winds together. And that's exactly what happens with sin or transgression. That, That sounds nicer than sin, doesn't it? Transgression and guilt and shame because if you begin to talk about one of those it's very hard to talk about it without talking about the other two because they are interlocked together and all of us have been impacted in our lives in some form shape or fashion by that stronghold Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2 says it this way in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, you're a sinner. Did that feel good? (laughs) Now I want you to turn back to him and say, so am I. (laughs) Every one of us have been guilty of sin. It's just inevitable because you're born into the world that was infected by sin back in the Garden of Eden. And every person that's ever born is born with that sin nature. We're born with our spirit dead to God. And it's interesting how sin affects us. There's sin that is sin of commission. In other words, it's things we commit. It's that time when you've already had two bowls of ice cream and you say, okay, I'm going to change this. And you throw away the bowl and just eat the whole carton. 
That's a sin of commission. You planned to do it, and you thoroughly enjoyed it until after it was done. And every one of us have those kind of encounters within our lives. And then the other one, and this one's probably more deadly, and it's probably sometimes harder for us to identify, is the sin of omission. In other words, things that I should do, but I just don't do them. Things that I know are right, and yet somehow I just don't measure up. How many of you made New Year's resolutions at the beginning of this year? A few of you. How many of you are still doing all those? Isn't it funny how that, uh, how that slips as the year progresses? Because here's what happens. You make that determination that you are going to work out every day. And you're doing so good and then somewhere about the third week in January, you hit a morning that you have an early appointment that day that you don't normally have, which means you have to get up earlier than normal. And so you think to yourself, you know what, I know that I've been working out every morning when I first get up, but today I've got to go to that appointment and I don't want to have to get up 30 minutes or an hour earlier, so I'll just work out tonight when I get home. And then what happens when you get home that night? Man, I am just so tired. Tomorrow I'll be back on schedule. And tomorrow you are. And you do good for another three or four days. And then one morning the alarm doesn't go off. You think, I'll do it tonight. And then guess what happens? Over a period of time, you're doing it less and less. And yet you're still visiting the refrigerator just as often or maybe more now. Omission, omitting to doing the things that we really should be doing. And what complicates that even more is because we don't live in a world where we are hermits. I mean, if you did, you wouldn't be here this morning. You, you basically live in a world where you interact with other people. And just a minute ago, you really reached out to your neighbor in love. You told them they were a sinner. And it's true. And yet the reality is, is that all of us get impacted by what other people do that's sinful behavior in this world. A drunk driver gets on the road and runs into a car with a family and the family's killed by his sin of not controlling his consumption of alcohol and then driving a car when he shouldn't be. Abusive parents, spouses, bosses, employees who take advantage of their situation and are slipping money in their pocket out of the company's income. And the company gets affected. The owner of the company is affected. Sin is an insidious thing within our world. And if that wasn't enough, the enemy managed to wind in with sin, this thing of guilt. Do you ever feel guilty about things? You think about, man, I wish I'd done that. I should have done something earlier. I let that get by me. And what begins to happen is we learn how to have guilt as a part of our way of life. Because we are going to miss the mark. And the guilt overwhelms us because the sin nature that we had before Jesus came into our heart tries to rise itself even against believers who no longer are caught in the power of sin. They're now caught in the power of guilt that the enemy puts on them because they don't walk in the freedom they've been given over sin. And you and I need to understand that you're never going to be able to deal with the guilt for yourself. You're not going to be able to fix it. It's only when we begin to understand we've been pardoned that we understand that guilt has no right to impinge our lives. It has no right to hold us backwards. And what happens is, is then... As sin and guilt take their hold, 
then there's this condemnation that comes into us. That's why I love Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Shame. It's a terrible word. And yet every one of us feels shame. I, I remember I was probably, I think I was less than four years old. The time my family was in the little grocery store we went into to do our little shopping, the little community store, the Murphy's grocery store. And I remember seeing that bubble gum and lifting it and putting it in my mouth. And that was before the day of cameras. I got away with it. I was in the back seat of the car and we had one of those old woody station wagons. I was in the third seat chomping on the gum and suddenly I felt this horrible stare. And my dad was looking through the rearview mirror. And he says, Bill Andrew? And I knew when, when both names got used, that meant you're in deep doo-doo. Where'd you get that gum? And I was so ashamed. And I'll never forget this. I, I can still feel it. And, and this has been a long time ago. I need therapy. But <laughs> I still remember when he said to me, here, reached in his pocket, took out a penny, and said, you take that in to Mr. Murphy and give it to him and tell him you're sorry you stole the gum. I want to tell you that was the longest walk of my life back into that store. As I got older, I think about it now, I would have gotten inside the store, just pocketed a penny and got back in the car. But I was still young enough to be touched. And I remember taking the penny in, paying it. And Mr. Murphy was so kind, but the shame. And I could tell you other stories in my life that have created shame, but I won't, that were more horrendous than taking a piece of gum. But there isn't a person in this room, there isn't a person online today that hasn't somewhere dealt with that awful feeling of shame. And the enemy takes transgression, guilt, and shame, and he binds those together to become a stronghold in our life. So that the further we live, the more we go, we very easily begin to develop this sense of unworthiness, of no value. We come up with all kinds of ways to cover it up. We come up with all kinds of false confidence and, and false assurance to try to make it appear that we're better than we are. And yet underneath that all, there is something within us that just bears us down. And it begins to become the ashes of the brokenness in our life. And if that weren't enough... Then there's another area that the enemy works in that becomes its own unique stronghold but then works with that stronghold of transgression, guilt, and shame. And that's the stronghold of offense, unforgiveness, and bitterness. Ephesians 4.31 tells us this. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Every one of us have been offended. You ladies ever had somebody come up to you and say, that is a beautiful outfit you have on today. And you're just thinking, that's wonderful. And you know, just like that, it can be turned if the person says it's a shame it doesn't fit you. What happens then? You become offended. 
It's interesting, when we first become believers, we think that we'll never get offended because now we're hanging out with Christians. Anybody ever think that when you first gave your heart to Jesus and you thought, now it's all going to be wonderful because everybody loves Jesus, everybody's going to be nice to each other? I bet right now every person here and online could take me back to the first time a Christian offended you. Because you remember it because it was such a shock. Because how could that happen in the house of God? And, and, you know, I I think about the things that churches have split over. I still never will forget the little church in East Texas. I can't tell you what the real name of the church is. It was a little Baptist church. But nobody knew it by its name because they called it Lockout Church. You know why? Why? Because they got mad at the pastor and they decided they didn't want him there anymore but they didn't have the courage to fire him so they just changed the locks on the door so he couldn't get in. So for years if someone said something about that church it was called lockout. And man how many places have we locked out in our lives? Are there people that you will go around the block to keep from having to talk to? Just because they've hurt you, they've offended you, they've done something they shouldn't have done. The other thing that's even sadder than that is sometimes we get offended over things we think they thought. Now that's a little sick, but before you get too sanctimonious, somewhere along the line you've done that. And isn't it amazing when you find out later that they didn't even know what you were talking about? And yet we all deal with offense. Because no matter what, no matter how perfect we are, we still do things we shouldn't do. You could ask Grace. I don't think I've ever done anything offensive to her. (laughs) This morning. (laughs) Have I? (laughs) As much as we love each other, we have at times offended one another. Not even intending to do it. It's going to happen in the best of relationships. It's going to happen in the best of churches. You know how that you will make a perfect church? If you don't go to it. Because we're all going to mess up. There's somewhere a point at which we accept the fact that offense is going to happen. But what we end up doing is we let it become a chokehold within our lives. And sometimes we carry things for years and years and years because somebody hurt us somewhere along the way and we refuse to let go of it. We're offended. And that offense keeps us from the fullness of what God wants to do within our lives. And then then there's another strand of this stronghold which is the handcuffs of unforgiveness you know Jesus freely forgave us but he makes it very clear at the end of the Lord's prayer he makes it very clear that if we are to receive his forgiveness we have to forgive those who wronged us that we have to somewhere be willing to release whatever happens. You know what's the strangest thing about unforgiveness? And the reason I call it the handcuffs of unforgiveness is when you don't forgive people, guess what's happened? You can't get them out of your head. Everywhere you turn, you're thinking about them. You're thinking about how they've hurt you, how they've done what they've done to you. And so the unforgiveness handcuffs you to them. Would you want to be handcuffed to a corpse? I don't think so. Then why in the world would we handcuff ourselves to something as deadly as unforgiveness? Because unforgiveness will over time totally destroy us. And one of the things that's so important to remember is this. We, we say, okay, I, I want to forgive them, but, but until I can trust them, I can't forgive them. You need to understand those are two separate terms. There are people that I can forgive, but I don't trust. And there's nothing wrong with that. Because 
Trust is a different issue than forgiveness. If you come up to me today and take your fist and just hit me, I'll find a way to forgive you. Please don't do it to find out if I'm telling the truth. But I'll find a way to forgive you. But I'm going to tell you something. The next time you take your hand and it starts to go up, I'm going to duck. Because it'll be a long time before I trust you. It's the difference. And you and I need to understand that so that we can allow forgiveness to have its work. And we think we've got it all taken care of, and then it stirs back up again. That's why Jesus told the disciples, <clears throat> when they said, how many times do we forgive? Seven. He said, 70 times seven. Because he knew that things are going to keep coming back. We're going to remember them because it's tied to that offense. It's tied to that thing that gets us. And so in time, what happens is that unforgiveness will just take hold and will think, well, I'm never going to be able to do it. No, forgive again. And then if it comes back up next week, forgive again. If it comes back, forgive again. Continue to release it. Continue to ask God to release the offense that has come in your life. And I'll tell you another step of this is forgive yourself. A lot of people have never forgiven themselves for things they've done are things that have happened that they take responsibility for. And you and I need to understand that if Jesus has forgiven us, we are forgiven. There are things that whatever you did, you can what if all day long about how it could have been different. But it is where it is today. Accept the forgiveness of God that he has given you and forgive yourself. Let it go. Because what happens is, as this stronghold is built, the third element of it begins to take hold. And that's the cancer of bitterness. Have you ever met a bitter person? They're not very fun to be around. Because they're very cynical. They, they actually expect you to do something to them. Sometimes they'll antagonize you trying to get you to do something so they can be right that you were going to. And it's easy over time to build up a sense of bitterness of all the things that have gone wrong. And, and people even get bitter at God. How did he let that happen? What brought me to that place? Why am I in the place that I'm at? Why did things not work out the way I thought they would? Why am I dealing with what I'm dealing with? And the enemy takes that stronghold. And he uses the offense to create the unforgiveness. And the unforgiveness to create the bitterness. And then they lock together. And they create a burned out life. Because you reach a point to where you don't trust anybody. You reach a point to where you don't want to believe in anybody. You even reach a point to where you can't trust God. And that's what the enemy uses is because of things that have happened within our lives that legitimately we were offended by, but because we didn't allow what God has done for us to set us free, that stronghold builds up. And so there's two strong, definitive strongholds that take hold in our lives and destroy what God intended for good. And that is the stronghold of transgression, guilt, and shame, and the stronghold of offense, unforgiveness, and bitterness. But I'm here to tell you today that there's no reason why those have to to have the power we give them because the power they have is only the power we allow them to have because here's the key this is the key that will take a broken life like Arthur Millard and turn it around did you know that before he died he set aside $600 a month for 10 years so that his son Brad could develop the music career that he would have. The man who used to beat him turned around and provided a legacy for him so that he could become who he should be. What was the difference? Because in the midst of the ashes of Arthur's life, he found the bedrock foundation of the blood of Jesus 
and resurrection power. If you think that Easter is once a year, you need to have a revelation of truth. Every day is Easter Sunday for me because it's Easter weekend. Because the blood of Jesus cleanses me from all unrighteousness. And there is no condemnation because the resurrection power of Jesus Christ lives inside of me. <clears throat> the key for us to have ashes turned into beauty is in this truth in Revelation chapter 12 verse 11. They have defeated him by the blood of the Lamb and by their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. Listen, you and I need to recognize the eradicating power of the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus covers it all. There is nothing that you've done. <clears throat> There's nothing you can do that the blood of Jesus is not sufficient to cover. How many of you have ever had something get spilled on your clothes? And you forgot to spot clean it and you put it in the wash. And then it was locked in more than ever. But if you took the special cleaner that works better than ever. And sprayed it on the spot ahead of time. The spot disappeared. But have you ever had a spot that you tried all the cleaners, you tried everything, and it still wouldn't disappear? Yeah. But I'm going to tell you something. The blood of Jesus covers it all. There's nothing that it isn't sufficient for. You know, it's amazing when you think of the atrocities of Adolf Hitler. And what happened in, in the Holocaust and all of the damage of World War II. But do you know if Adolf Hitler would have repented, it would have been washed away. That's how powerful the blood of Jesus is. And so whatever it is that you struggle with, whatever it is that's overwhelming to you, Calvary covers it. There is no power of sin that his blood doesn't control. It's important to not forget that. <clears throat> but the other part of that he says, we've defeated him by the blood of the lamb and by their testimony. Now I want you to think for a minute when it says by their testimony, what is our testimony? <clears throat> when we give a testimony of something that God's done in our life, he saved us, if he's healed you, if he's done something for you financially, he's done something in a relationship, and you say, I want to thank God because I was sick and the doctors can't explain it, but I've been made well. Do you understand that that is the resurrection power of Jesus at work within you? That your testimony says this, the blood of Jesus has been sufficient, but I'm living in the power of the resurrection. It was not just enough for Jesus to go to the cross, even though that had to happen. But the cross couldn't be the end for there to be victory. The victory came when on that third day, the tomb was empty, he arose. And it's the resurrection power of Jesus, that's what takes the offense away. That's what gives us the ability to step beyond. That is what causes us to be able to live past what would happen to us in just the whole issue of unforgiveness, bitterness, all of those things, guilt and shame. The resurrection power of Jesus gives us the ability to be transformed. So it's important for us to understand both the cross and the tomb have to be empty for it to work. And here's the good news. They are both empty. Yes. Hallelujah. 
Jesus is not on the cross. He's not in the tomb. He is triumph for you. And that's the bedrock foundation that will take a life like Arthur Millard's and totally turn it around. And that same power is available to every one of us for whatever it is that we deal with. And the good news is this. It's not just available for special cases. It's not just for one or two things in our lives. It's a continuous process. I need the blood of Jesus to cleanse me from unrighteousness on a daily basis. Because I have unrighteous thoughts. I have things that I still do that I shouldn't do. And I need the blood of Jesus to take that away. To take the guilt and the shame. To keep me from living under offense and unforgiveness and bitterness at things that have been done to me. People have done bad things to me. But you know what? It doesn't matter. Because I have the resurrection power that gives me the ability to shake off the offense, to let go of the unforgiveness, to not live in bitterness, and to live in the completeness. And God has even given me the ability to have compassion for people who've done harm. It's amazing what happens when we begin to get it. You see, we also need to understand that while that's the bedrock, we also have the complete covering and empowering energy of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Acts 4.29, And now, O Lord, hear their threats and give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After this prayer, the meeting place shook, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. All the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon all of them. <clears throat> in the midst of what's going on in our world, listen, don't cower down. Declare the word of God with boldness. Declare that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Declare that you are overcoming by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of your testimony. Declare that you are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. And then begin to recognize that we have healing power, miraculous signs, and wonders as a normal part of Christian living. Say, well, well, then why do I have the problems I have? Well, all I know is this. That I continue to believe for anything that comes against this body. That the healing power of Jesus is sufficient. And I continue to stand in that until I see it manifested. And if I ever reached a point where it wasn't manifested in this body, it would be manifested because I'll be in heaven with Jesus and there is no sickness there. But in the meantime, I don't use that as a cop-out. I'm going to walk in the healing power of God in this world. I'm not going to deny when things attack the physical body, but I'm determined to believe until I see the physical results that align with God's Word. I believe that we have miraculous signs. There are going to be things we're going to watch God do on a consistent basis that we're going to look back, and there's not going to be any other way to explain it than God just did it for us. And there's wonders that we watch the wonders of God. That when we think back to the goodness of God and what he's done, I, I was just thinking where all God's brought me since I went through divorce in the 1980s and had to close down the church I was pastoring. And in the natural, it looked like it was the end. But I have lived a life since the 1980s of looking at the ashes and I've watched God raise up over and over again His power so that there have been multiple healings. I've seen miraculous signs and wonders. And furthermore, the best is still yet to come. Because what you and I need to live in is the blessing of the fruit and the gifts of the Spirit. 
And then it comes down to that understanding of what this is all about. That's so said so well in Isaiah chapter 61. And that's the great exchange of beauty for ashes. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come. And with it the day of God's anger against their enemies. To all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes. A joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. What you and I have to do is come to a place where we surrender when we recognize the place of brokenness and bankruptcy in our life. There is that point at which you say, God in myself, I can't do this. But I lay myself on the altar before you. I'm yours. Whatever you want to do with me, whatever you choose in my life, I give it to you. I'm going to quit struggling with it. I'm going to quit trying to make things happen. I'm going to quit trying to accomplish it myself. And I surrender it all into your hands. And then at that place of surrender, begin to recognize God's favor is on you. Now, I want you to turn back to your neighbor and say a nicer thing to them. Say, God's favor is on you. I want that to soak in. Because some of you are going through some tough things right now. Some of you can really relate to the shame or the guilt or the unforgiveness, the offense and the bitterness. But I'm going to tell you something. Those are not what identify you. Those are the strongholds of the enemy you've been set free from. But whatever you're facing right now, you're not facing it in defeat. You have God's favor. His favor is upon you. His anger is turned toward your enemies. I mean, and you don't need to go tell your enemies, don't mess with me. God's angry with you. He'll show them. But David in Psalm 23 says, He prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. God's favor. And then what that means is that he will exchange and give us beauty and take the ashes of our past, the brokenness, the things we still can't fix, the things we still struggle with, the things that we don't understand why they still gnaw at us. Those are ashes he wants to take and he wants to give you his beauty. He wants to give you joyous blessing. And take away the mourning. So that you don't sorrow anymore. That you begin to have a festive praise for the despair. And then that you become planted deeply. So that when the storms come. You stand. For the glory of the Lord. I believe that this is such an important word. For the hour we live in. It really still is kind of mind-boggling, isn't it? When you think about where we are. I I, I went into Walmart yesterday. And uh, it was interesting because Walmartians were still there, but they all had masks on. It felt strange because I parked down where there weren't many cars by the door that was close to where I wanted to get stuff only to find out you can't go in and out that door can I tell you that I almost went in it anyway really thought about it and I thought it would be best to not have the headlines in today's paper pastor arrested for trespassing at Walmart and I thought what a strange time we're living in but listen It's time for the church of Jesus Christ to rise up. We are living in such a parallel time with the 1960s. 
If you haven't studied anything of the history of the 1960s in America, go back and read about it. Because it was literally in 1968, I, I remember this, April 4th of 1968, in Memphis, Tennessee, Martin Luther King was shot over what he was doing for civil rights. Just be a few months later till Bobby Kennedy was shot on June 6th in a hallway in a kitchen at a hotel where he had just given a speech where he was moving rapidly toward becoming the Democratic nominee for president that year. I can't imagine what the Kennedy family must have felt after John Kennedy having been killed just the few years before that. Our nation was in disarray. You go back into 1967, was called the long hot summer, when dozens of cities had seen far more destructive rights than what even happened in 68, with both Detroit, New York, New, Jer New, York, New Jersey decimated. And after King's death, a thousand buildings were burned in Washington, D.C. alone. In Chicago, 11 people were killed in 48 hours. Hundreds of buildings destroyed. Nearly 20,000 police and National Guard were sent in. Sounds like today's headlines, doesn't it? Except, thank God, we haven't had a national leader assassinated. But we've had the tragedy of George Floyd death. Still tragedy. But this morning, I'm here to tell you, don't lose sight of what God's doing. Because it was in the late 60s, in the midst of that atmosphere, in the ashes of what looked like America falling apart, that there began to be a move of God that was a charismatic renewal that began to take the power of the Holy Spirit and move it from just small Pentecostal churches on the wrong side of the tracks in towns into churches of all denominations, into the Catholic Church throughout the United States and around the world with a powerful move of God that then teamed up with the Jesus movement that began to work in the young people of the 60s and began to cause them to come to a place of realizing morality, living holy lives, and letting their lives be set free from drugs and the power of darkness so that there was a real move of God that happened in this land in the 70s. So I'm here to tell you, I believe that the 60s and 70s are a prophetic picture of where we are today. And I know that there are folks who are telling us that we need to buy guns and food and store them away because of how awful it's going to be in November. Shame on somebody for instead saying, church, rise up. Because we can change the course of what is happening. If we will take God's beauty and allow it to begin to rise in us out of the ashes of what's happening in the world around us, it is time for a fresh move of God. It is time for the church of Jesus Christ to arise and come to the occasion and say, we are the people of God and we refuse to be anything less. And if you're here personally, and the life that you've lived has had a lot of disappointment, feels like there's a lot of ashes, I want you to bring those to Jesus this morning and let him release his beauty in your life. The things that you struggle with and how you think, how you feel, what you've experienced, you don't have to fix all those. All you have to do is bring those ashes to him and say, here they are. Now would you give me your beauty and begin to concentrate on the beauty of God. Allow him to bring you to full knowledge of Jesus. Allow him to fill you with his Holy Spirit and to become everything God wants you to be. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. If you're joining us online, I'm going to pray a simple prayer. And I'm going to ask you to pray it with me. If you're in the room and you don't know Jesus, I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer. If you know him, 
but you haven't experienced the fullness of His Spirit, pray this prayer with me. Everyone prays an affirmation for those who are praying it that have not prayed it before. And then whatever you need in your own life, receive. Say, Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. Here's my ashes. I give them to you. And now I receive your beauty. Your salvation. The resurrection power. And your Holy Spirit. And I ask you to baptize me. With the power of your Holy Spirit. And let me walk in the fullness of your Holy Spirit. I ask you for the fruit to grow in me. I receive the gifts of your Spirit. And I thank you, O God, that I'm a part of the answer, not the problem. The stronghold of guilt, shame, transgression is broken. The stronghold of offense, unforgiveness, and bitterness is broken. I receive the beauty of everything you are in Jesus' name. Now this week, walk in that. Become everything God's called you to be.